In mid-June of 2012, UCI representatives in Israel, Hannah Gavon and Judith Nussbaum, attended a significant leadership conference entitled The Status of Jerusalem Under International Law. Dr. Jacques Gauthier was a featured speaker at the conference, and just outside, we were privileged to hear from Howard Grief, historian, legal expert, and author of the book, The Legal Foundation and Borders of Israel Under International Law. Here's that interview. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak to you at this conference on behalf of the Unity Coalition for Israel. I've been reading your book. I downloaded it on Kindle, and now I have no space for anything else. The Legal Foundation and Borders of Israel Under International Law, and it's a fascinating, wonderful book. It is, I think, perhaps a definitive piece on San Remo, the influence of San Remo on the mandate, the influence of that with the League of Nations Agreement, and on us today. Uh, I'd like you to say a few words about that, and then we're going to go into one other subject. Okay. Well, I started this uh, research uh, back in the 1970s, although not on the legal aspects. I mean, I, uh, during the 1970s, all the uh, commentaries were concerned about Israel's occupied territories. And I, I, I was against, I mean, I disagree with that very strongly. And then um, in 1982, I decided to tackle these issues and find out, and deal only with the legal aspects. Um, so I started my legal research uh, beginning in 1982 in order to refute uh, the libel that uh, Judea and Samaria and the rest of the liberated territories were, were occupied territories under international law. That was the uh, reason I started uh, to think about writing a book. And uh, I uh, gathered together archival material from the uh, uh, British, uh, for, uh, not the British Foreign Office, the Public Office, uh, uh, Public Archive Office. And I, I wrote from Montreal, and fortunately, they sent me a tremendous amount of material. Uh, Doreen Ingram wrote a book uh, on this, uh, in which she mentioned all the uh, uh, important points of how the mandate was formulated. And when I wrote to the public record office, I said, can you give me the same uh, material that Doreen Ingram? So I, after paying a couple thousand bucks, I got all of the uh, archival material, and I arranged it as best as I could. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I started, that's how I found out about the San Remo resolution. It's a term I coined to indicate the agreement that was made. Uh, everyone, uh, before I started writing, San Remo, resol San Remo was only thought of as where the mandate was granted, but it was mm -hmm. much more than that. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, I, I that's where I made my uh, deductions, my analysis, my study to to show that the um, what was decided at San Remo uh, was uh, the uh, source for Jewish legal rights to the whole country, not merely to Jerusalem, but to all of Eretz Israel, including Transjordan, and even the areas that were not included in the mandate for Palestine, because. The San Remo Resolution adopted a formula for including within Palestine all the borders that it were historically connected with Palestine. That definitely included not only Gilead in Transjordan, but also the land north of the Yarmouk River, which in ancient times was called Bashan, and in Ottoman times was called Horam. And this area was gobbled up by the French in favor of French-mandated Syria. If you look at the map of Syria, it's, it's very large, and they took our territory, actually. And the French also took our territory up to the Otani River. None other than Chaim Weizmann was claiming the area up to the Otani River in his presentation before the Paris Peace Conference in February of 1919. And uh, because the areas were all areas associated with historical Palestine were supposed to be included in the mandate for Palestine, uh, as well as certain areas that had economic and strategic and military importance, and that included all the areas east of Gilead, uh, um, that is the, the desert 
of Transjordan that extends right up to, to the border of Iraq. And furthermore, Sinai is not to be forgotten. I keep making this point. I made it many times. I learned it from my boss, Yuval Neumann, the Minister of Energy and, uh, and Infrastructure, to whom I was the uh, legal advisor on, on the land of Israel. Sinai is not Egypt. <coughs> Ben-Gurion stated this three times in his speech to the Knesset on November 7, 1956, called the, it called the kingdom, Third Kingdom of Israel speech. When Moses crossed the Red Sea, he left Egypt and entered Sinai. And Egypt and Sinai are two different entities. That's what David Ben-Gurion said. So this land should have been attached to, uh, to Palestine. It's mentioned in our Torah. It's not mentioned at all in, in Egyptian sources. Uh, at least we're talking about the modern period. Menachem Begin, in his, I could only say, unwisdom or stupidity, uh, decided that he would give all of Sinai to Egypt, which for me meant that the, the treaty he signed was illegal. And I, I, uh, uh, I quote Ben Gurion and I quote Yuval Neumann that Sinai actually should have been given to us. Perhaps maybe the northwestern part of Sinai uh, uh, was ruled by Egypt. That was the only part it claimed up until 1948. When Egypt saw that the Jewish state came into existence, suddenly they claimed all of Sinai. But the, uh, the San independent Sanjak of, Jer of Jerusalem under Ottoman Turkish rule included all of central Sinai, a good half of it, uh, with Jerusalem as part of the borders of, the, of this. San Sanjak is the equivalent of a county, and uh, Vilyad is the equivalent of a province. But Jerusalem had a special status. It was called the Independent Sanjak. Uh, there was a special Turkish name for it, the Mustafa Rich of Jerusalem. And um, the, most of Sinai, at least half of it, should have gone to the uh, Jewish National Home. Moving on that idea of the land belonged to the Jews, on what basis does Israel have the right to Judea and Samaria, the same points that yes. you're making now? Yes. Judea and yes, I'm glad you asked me this question because it's, it's, uh, it's so confused. Even today we heard from Professor Sion. I don't want to criticize Professor Sion. He's a famous professor there at the uh, Ariel right. University Center. By no means does, do our rights depend on a war of self-defense, as he indicated in his speech. Uh, because uh, our title, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Goche said, preceded that by, many, by three decades. UN Resolution 242 refers to the inadmissibility of territory by war. It doesn't even distinguish between war of self-defense and, and a war of aggression. So uh, UN Resolution 242 is completely uh, illogical because our title did not depend on acquisition of territory by by war, whether it's a, de a war of defense or a war of aggression. In Jordan's case, it was a war of aggression, and they they captured Judea, Samaria, and e and the eastern part of Jerusalem, and that was completely illegal. So that's one part. You have to um, state that our right has. If you adopt that argument, that's, I would call that a minimalist argument, or the worst argument to make. Uh, the best argument to make is regarding our title of sovereignty that was vested in the Jewish people in 1920 at the San Remo Peace Conference. It, there was a two-pronged uh, two decision in 1920. On April 24th, the principal Allied powers meeting in the Italian resort city of San Remo endorsed over French objections, vigorous French objections, to the Balfour Declaration. The French uh, representatives, one was called uh, Prime Minister Millerand, uh, and uh, the other one was Philippe Brutolo, who was the, in effect, the foreign secretary and, and head of, the head of the French. They said the Balfour Declaration was dead. They said that in April 24, 1920. Can you imagine that? Balfour Declaration is dead. But during the course of the of the uh, discussions, 
Lord Curzon, who was a vicious anti-Zionist, had to defend Zionism against the French onslaught. And Curzon said, look, I promised the Zionists that we will stick to the Balfour Declaration, we won't change a letter. And, uh, uh, and so uh, the, uh, uh, the, the four Allied powers represented with three prime ministers there, David Lord George, and Francisco Nitti of Italy and, and, and Alexander Milleran of France, who later became the president of France, and the, and the Japanese ambassador Matsui, and the American observer uh, Johnson. They, uh, would, uh, the, uh, the Americans had no input into the decision since they had not declared war against mm -hmm. Turkey, but the four Allied powers endorsed the Balfour Declaration. Now, what did that mean? <coughs> that meant recognition that Palestine was to be governed by the Balfour Declaration. That was on October, uh, April 24th, 1920. And in the, on the same day, the San Remo Resolution was introduced, which required Britain, which was one of the four allied powers, to put into effect. Those are the key words, put into effect. It wasn't to use their best facilities for the achievement of this object, as the 1917 Balfour Declaration said. Mm -hmm. In other words, the Balfour Declaration in 1917 was optional. They, they, only, they, ha they only had to use their best endeavors, but the San Remo Resolution was no longer optional. They had to put it into effect. That was obligatory, and that <coughs> resolution was introduced on the 24th of um, April 19. And adopted the very next day as the uh, as a as a document known as the San Remo Resolution. Howard, I don't want to give the whole book away. <laughs> I'm sorry it's not in Hebrew. I wish it were in Hebrew for those people who would prefer it in Hebrew. But at this point, you can get it on Kindle. Yes. You can buy it in, in Amazon. A and Pomerant. it is and a Pomerant, and it's an eye opener. And I think it's wonderful. And I thank you so much for letting us. Thank you. Thank I, you. I may add that I'm trying to convince the Ariel University Center to publish this book in Hebrew. Oh, I think and, that's wonderful. And I met a little headway with the uh, CEO, uh, Ego Cohen Organ, and put the meeting mm -hmm. in several months uh, for this purpose. Okay. So thank you so much for coming and thank you for having Learn the valuable secret Israeli leadership has not yet realized in today's war of ideas and help the Unity Coalition for Israel to share this key message as widely as possible. For a donation of any amount, we will send you the riveting DVD, UCI's Stand Firm on San Remo Congressional Briefing. UCI, working together with Senator Jerry Moran of Kansas, presented expert testimonies to both House and Senate staffers in the Capitol building during our recent trip to Washington, D.C. Our message is to legislators in both America and Israel. The right of the Jews worldwide to specific territory of the Palestinian Mandate was spelled out in 1920 at the San Remo, Italy Peace Conference, when the victorious Allied powers divided the Ottoman Empire. 78% went to the Arabs and 22% to the Jews. Learn the actual historical facts which enable Israel to stand firm on San Remo.